in the back. Thank you, Senator. Mr. President, <clears throat> uh, history will record that Senator Urquhart's words will come home to haunt her in the future, as indeed will many of those who have so derisively commented adversely on the outcomes of this report. Let me put on the record, Mr. President, I am very much in favour of aspects of renewable energy. I proudly ordered and had constructed the largest number of small-scale solar units, hot water systems, uh, some 240, the largest order that had ever been placed in Western Australia. I also had responsibility for the first wind turbine uh, in Western Australia, and it failed. In fact, the first four, all, all four of them failed, but that's history. The third I want to place on record is my strong support for hydroelectricity in your state uh, and, of course, uh, in uh, the Snowy Mountains, because ultimately when you can generate in the high peak periods and when you can use off-peak power to pump water back up to generate again the next time it is needed, that has got to be surely the ultimate value <coughs> of uh, renewable energy. But I've got to say to you that wind turbines, I don't even think it's renewable uh, energy, Mr President. I reflected on this driving back from Sydney uh, on a Sunday, and I'd happened to be looking past the wind turbines there at Capitol Hill or wherever they're called. I started to say to myself, well, I want to have a look at this in both environmental and in economic terms. So I said to myself environmentally, what's the environmental benefit of wind turbines? And of course the benefit would be greenhouse gases forgiven during the generation process. So I said that's good. So that's the positive of the benefit. So where are the negatives? What do you have to take off that greenhouse gas forgiven? Well, first of all, you've got to take off the massive cost of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, used in the construction, the original iron ore, the steel, the transportation, the massive, the tens of thousands of tonnes of concrete that goes into each of these. And in fact, we had evidence that Senator Urquhart didn't like it much, but we had evidence from a Mr Hamish Cumming, who I found to be a very credible witness, that um, about 16 years of the use of a wind turbine would be necessary before you'd actually get back to the cost benefit of the uh, greenhouse gases forgiven as a result of the uh, construction. But the next one, of course, too, what do you take off that greenhouse gas benefit? You take off the cost of the baseload generated electricity, the carbon dioxide required, of course, when you need coal or gas or whatever other form of baseload generation you need in reserve. Because when the wind doesn't blow and the ship doesn't go, Mr. President, you do need another form uh, of baseload power. And then, of course, something that's going to have a profound effect on people who are hosting wind turbines and local governments around this country, and that's going to be the environmental cost of decommissioning these wind turbines at the end. So I suspect there is very little, if any, actual uh, environmental benefit. I then looked at economic benefits. And the benefit, of course, from wind turbines would be the value of the power generated. But from that, what do you, must de uh, de uh, what do you deduct? You've got to deduct these huge costs of the renewable energy certificates that are quaintly uh, absorbed and, and, and the burden on consumers. But funnily enough, you know, consumers are also taxpayers. Isn't that amazing? No, this, is not, this is not a tax. The renewable energy certificate, Mr. President, not a tax. It's a cost to the consumer. Somehow or other, I don't think they're different people. And again, you must take that economic benefit in an equation. You must take away the dollar value of the baseload power that's sitting there doing nothing in case the wind blows or it doesn't blow. Or into the future, I hope we see effective, valuable um, battery storage, whether we do or not. But nevertheless, it still comes at a cost. And therefore, if you want to look at the economic benefits uh, of these wind turbines, then it is one of the costs. And again, you've got the dollar values of the decommissioning process. It's disappointing. I do admire that Senator Urquhart, or indeed in uh, Cairns, uh, that your Deputy President, Senator Marshall, did attend each one of the hearings, and that's to their credit. Because I've also I've got to say that unfortunately the Greens political party, despite the fact that Senator Seawitt chaired uh, the inquiry in 2009, the Greens chose to not participate at all in this inquiry, and I don't think that's to their credit. 
But Senator Urquhart mentioned the Canadian study, which has been put out there as a very credible study. Uh, Mr. President, until you actually get some advice from other credible Canadian scientists who told us that when the data was collated, all this massive Canadian data, they just happened to reject, with no reasons given, the majority of the data that was captured and collated. They decided to ignore it, no reasons given. The other interesting thing is that they also decided to eliminate all of those people under the age of 18 and older than 79 years. No reason given, just drop them off. Under 18, over 79, they don't count. Well, in the days that I was around as a scientist, uh, Mr President, if without explanation somebody was to produce international results and ask for them to be credited, I would expect them to give some explanation as to why they'd wipe out a significant proportion of the population and, indeed, a significant amount of the data set. Our dear friend Professor Chapman speaks of the nocebo effect, and this is the effect that you think you're going to get sick from wind turbines or you think you're going to get sick going out in a boat, so you do. And initially, Professor Chapman always would say, well, I've never ever heard of a host who, if he's making money or she's making money out of these, got sick. Well, the first one, unfortunately, for dear old Professor Chapman was Mr and Mrs Mortimer, a retired uh, naval officer whose sphere of influence happened to be the movement of waves through solids, liquids and gases. So he knew a little bit about this. Mortimer was the first person to stand up and say, despite the fact the income we're getting from these couple of turbines is enormously important to our retirement income, we can't live on our farm. They couldn't see the turbines, funnily enough, but they knew when they were on. When they went away from their home for a week or so, strangely enough, the nocebo effect seemed to disappear. But the other more interesting one, you know, was a Mr and Mrs Gare, who appeared before us in Adelaide. Now, Mr and Mrs Gare, Mr President, make $200,000 a year from hosting wind turbines—200 big ones a year. And Mr and Mrs Gare said to us, if we could have our time over again, if we could get rid of these wind turbines and get rid of the $200,000 so that we could go back to living on our farm and working on our farm, we would do it tomorrow. Don't know where the nocebo effect came in there, Professor Chapman. But in the time available left to me, President, and I gather that the next speaker will hopefully seek leave to continue remarks, all I do is ask this question. I ask it of Senator Urquhart, I ask it of others who appeared before us. Why do these people carry on the way they do? A case down at Cape Bridgewater, five generations of the family have lived on their farm. So what's in it for them to walk away from their community when they say they can't live? They're not really sick at all. You know, it's just in their heads. Well, it is in their heads. You're quite right. Nausea and anxiety and annoyance and sleeplessness is sure as hell in your head. But the question is, why would that family walk away? Why would their children not be able to go to school? Do they get compensation, Mr President, like the old RSI days. No, they don't. There's no compensation out there. There's no hope of any reward for carrying on like this. They lose their friends in their communities. We know that in many rural communities it tears communities apart. I've said before in this place that we have circumstances now in my own home state of Western Australia where bushfire brigade members don't turn out. Don't turn out if there happened to be a bushfire or a fire on the farm of one of the others opposed in this. CWA members, and they're the two pillars of rural communities, bushfire brigades and CWAs, people aren't going, they're not shopping in the towns. Why is that, I wonder? I mean, is it just they all of a sudden woke up one day and, as Senator Urquhart said, they're not sick at all? So their value of their properties, we learnt this all over Australia, the value of their properties are, are worthless effectively, they've not just gone down significantly. People who moved into the Barossa Valley for their change of lifestyle, the tree change, are now in a situation where they've had to walk away. So what's in it for them, Mr President? Generally there's got to be a motivator if you're going to change your whole lifestyle, if you're going to walk away from your friends. You bet your life. Don't worry about Senator Urquhart going on about English speaking. Germany, Finland. Why did the Prime Minister of the UK going into the election say he's going to stop subsidising on land? turbines and won the election. 
There's a long way to go in this story. I assure you it's not finished. Thank you, 